we're recording this so that we can put it online and uh, share it with the people who can't make it today. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming. There's still people coming in right now, um, but this is our second program for Native American History Month. Uh, it's called Saving Native Languages, the History of the Decline and Preservation of Native Languages. Um, and this is going to be um, kind of a format that we've played around with before um, in book clubs, um, but nothing like this. Uh, so, um, you know, if it if it works well, let us know and uh, hopefully you can do something more like this. Um, uh, again, as people are coming in, make sure you're muted. That way there's a uh, little feedback, um, but you will get a chance to talk if you if you want later on. Um, OK, and today we have. Several people here with us um, who are from the museum and from and partners as well. Um, Again, I'm Joyce Ganunis Medina. I work in community engagement here. Um, I have um, with me uh, Stephanie Davis. Uh, she's going to be helping me with questions. Um, and we also have one TSM education. It'll be Jeff Sellers, and he's also helping with any technical uh, issues. Um, so if you have any problems, you can go into the chat. The chat's going to be on the bottom right hand side of your screen, just click on that and ask questions. You can also send in any questions because we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our guests for the day. Uh, first, we have Charlie Rod Rodarmer. Uh, he is the director of the Sequoia Birthplace Museum in Venor, Tennessee. Um, hi, Charlie. Um, Yes, you just waved. Uh, we also have Dr. Gil Jackson, and he's a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee and a lecturer at the University of North Carolina Asheville, as well as Stanford University on the Cherokee language. Um, he also assisted with the Stories of Snowbird Day School project, working to uh, preserve the history of that school in Western North Carolina. Um, and we also have Lou Jackson, and she's also a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee and teaches Cherokee at the Cherokee Language Consor Consortium. So if you want to, if our guests want to unmute and say hi. Hello. Yeah. All right, and so today's program will be interactive and we will have questions as we go on. Um, so if you want to respond, all you have to do is unmute. Um, you could also respond in the chat, uh, whatever you feel more comfortable with. And the way that this will work is that we have an activity first. Um, you'll want to have a piece of paper um, and Google Translate pulled up if you would like to uh, be involved in that. Not a requirement, but it'll help you kind of get into the mindset of where we're going with this program. Um, and then after that, we'll go into some of the history and have some questions in dispersed. And then we'll have a bit of a Cherokee lesson um, where you can learn how Cherokee works and hear some uh, Cherokee being spoken uh, with Gil and Lou. Uh, so if we're if we're ready to get started. Um, I have no idea what's going on here. So I'm going to mute. Perfect. OK, um, let me share the screen and we're going to start with these questions. Okay.
as you can see here, it says translate one of the following sentences into your cultural language. Uh, so this can be any of your ancestors and it doesn't even have to be your grandma. It can be as far back as you want. Um, an example, I'm Puerto Rican and so I would translate this into Spanish. Um, so if you want to be a part of this, uh, just, you know, choose one of these sentences and translate it into the language of your past culture. And so I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Okay, if we're ready, I'm going to take it off of full screen. Okay, and does anyone want to share? What, what you'll do is that you will introduce yourself um, say what language you're translating into and uh, do your best to, to if you if you can't speak it, do your best to uh, read it. Yeah, people are not doing this because. Thank you to the person who did that. I I'll do mine. Um, so, like I said earlier, for me it would be Spanish, um, and so it would be Hola, me llamo Joyska. Easy enough. Right? She hears. She's hearing a bunch of people. But... She Again, yelled. You can unmute yourself and share. Cherokee. She yelled. Karen Lee Dogwado. Thank you. Do any of our presenters want to try? Thank you to the people responding in the chat. And if you want to do that in the chat, you're perfectly you can do that as well. We are we can move on and we do have some questions to go with that. Um, 
one of the aspects of that is that you have to have a knowledge of what your uh, your past cultures were or where your ancestors are from. And that's not always the case. People don't always know where their ancestors come from. Um, uh, take, for instance, any um, uh, black people who uh, came from Africa um, and were enslaved, they don't really have the roots of their, uh, of their tribes. Uh, most people don't know that. Um, or if you're adopted and you were never told your uh, where your birth family came from. Uh, so if there's anyone like that, or if anyone wants to take a stab at this question, uh, what does it mean to not have that knowledge? And what does it, what, what do you think that means to be detached from your past, um, yeah, your past ancestors and whatnot? I can um, share if that's okay, Joyce. Um, uh, speaking to um, not having that access um, to, to my ancestors, um, I think cultural traditions for me is something that's lost, um, and you know, specific rituals and <clears throat> other things specific to language that I would gain from knowing that um, is completely lost to me um, unless I um, I could do um, a DNA like myheritage.com or DNA and me, but that is not guaranteed to give me access to that missing piece of cultural um, information that would um, be great to have. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing. Um, we also have uh, Claire who responded saying a missing piece of a personal identity. And I'm sure that is entirely true. Um, even going back for, for many um, indigenous folks that um, saw mixing uh, can only go so far back um, before you, a lot of that's lost. Uh, so, Another question we have is, generally speaking to everyone, uh, where do you connect or how do you connect to your own cultural past? Um, do you, um, did you try learning uh, a language? Did you, do you make the food um, of your family? Do you uh, partake in a particular holiday or custom? Uh, that way you can feel closer to your culture. Is that something people do or do you have any examples of that? Well, for me, um, I I see my culture in the foods that I eat, um, especially during holidays. Uh, holidays are a big a big thing, um, as well as for me, dance. I started uh, getting into dancing, um, and if you ever go to any Latin American country, dancing is a very important part of the culture. Um, and I would say that that's the same for a lot of different cultures as well. So being able to take part in that helps me connect with my past and my people. So we'll move on, keep those things in mind. Um, and the purpose of that activity was to tie you to your cultural roots. Uh, for many indigenous groups, uh, the numbers of language speakers um, of the various languages are declining drastically. And 
language is in a very important way of tying to one's culture. Um, and that's why many indigenous groups are working um, and as well as their supporters are working to preserve their languages. But um, before we get into more of that information, um, we're gonna learn a little bit about Sequoia and um, the impact of his syllabary. So Charlie, if you wanna take over. Um, where do we begin? Um, Sequoia, when it's, as, as Cherokee culture is changing and what's happening, Sequoia is born around 1776. And um, by um, 1800, uh, George Washington had talked about it, but it was actually Thomas Jefferson actually came up with this Americanization program. And the Americanization program was to take all native peoples and to teach them to be like uh, the little European settlers, uh, to live on a 50 acre farm, grow their own food, uh, sell the surplus, raise their own cattle, hogs, um, learn industrial arts like blacksmithing, tinsmithing, coopering. Once again, making money, uh, being able to, you know, sustain themselves um, just like what the newcomers, the new little European settlers had been doing or were doing. And uh, Sequoia is a very prime example. George Gist, Sequoia, uh, he and his, um, his mother, uh, she takes over, Werta takes over the, the fur trading business, apparently from uh, Nathaniel, uh, her husband. And uh, Sequoia, we know from family, from other interviews, uh, different sources, that uh, Sequoia uh, worked in the trading post. Uh, he teaches himself to silversmith. Uh, at some point, he actually uh, built a, a spring house. His mother had milk cows, and they, uh, he built a spring house to store the cow's milk. And so as a result of this, uh, Sequoia and Huerta are very prime examples of the Americanization program. Um, and Sequoia teaches himself to silversmith, then he becomes a blacksmith. And we know Dr. Brett Riggs uh, did a survey, I think there was between eight to 10 Cherokees here in the Overhill uh, around 1810 that were blacksmithing. And so Sequoia would have been one of those. Uh, he would have learned at the Teleco Blockhouse um, the, the Telco blockhouse was set up as a, a post to make sure that no uh, uh, white settlers were encroaching on Cherokee territory. And so they would run patrols. If you had business to do uh, with the Cherokee, you would get a pass and then you would go in, uh, meet with whoever that you needed to, and then you would come back, back out at the blockhouse. As Thomas Jefferson came up with the Americanization, they created the factory, which was a part of that facility and the factory was kind of like a technical school. It was a trading post and it, it had uh, trade items that were um, reasonable and the Cherokee would go there uh, to trade and also to learn to do the different uh, uh, industrial arts, uh, cash crops, things like that. All that said, uh, that's where Sequoia would have learned those finer points of blacksmithing, uh, welding two pieces of metal together, tempering, uh, doing the different things that um, I worked my way through college as a blacksmith. And uh, I tried to learn when I was in high school and I had the advantage of books. And there were certain things I just couldn't get my, couldn't learn, couldn't do, couldn't. And when I got into college, I met a blacksmith and, and apprenticed under him. And he showed me how those things that I just couldn't get, he showed me how to do. And so I think Sequoia would have learned those finer points at the blockhouse. Um, and then this is where the problem is. He's blacksmithing and he can't remember what people owe him for the work that he does. And, you know, the Cherokee have a, a spoken language. Uh, if a lady gives me an apple and uh, a gentleman gives me two apples, I have three apples. Uh, they could say that in the Cherokee language, but they couldn't, they had no number symbols to write three, you know, one plus two equals three. 
it didn't have uh, uh, characters or symbols to write a sentence that she gave me an apple. He gave me two apples. So therefore I have three apples. And so Sequoia um, ends up, his problem is, like I say, he can't remember what people owe him for the work that he does. And so what he did first was he created a numbering system. And that's what you're looking at here on the screen uh, as we as I'm talking right now. Uh, just real quickly, the top line is 1 through 20. The second line is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Then you can kind of see what you do is you take the different letters. Um, the 1, 2, 3. The fourth line down is 1,000. So, uh, and the very this very last one down here uh, in the middle of the page is 1 million. And you would just basically take the different symbols and connect those together to say 33 or 999,999,999. And so you would use those symbols to write that out. And so he develops this numbering system and what, People said the family that he would actually use, he would take and draw a picture of the person's face and then using his numbering system to record what they owed him. And so it was a way of remembering. And it was in his blacksmith shop in 1909 that Sequoia said, hey, we could create a writing system. And so it was in 1809, he began a 12 year journey in trying to create a writing system, which he finished in 1821. We know he tries different types of writing systems. Uh, a symbol for a sentence, which, you know, works at first, but eventually uh, there's just too many. Uh, then he tries uh, symbols for each word, like hieroglyphics. Uh, and there again, he runs into problems. Um, the, one of the stories is one of the family stories. He's listening to birds sing and he hears repetitive songs in the sound. And that gets him to start listening to the Cherokee, his friends, his neighbors, his family and pulling out those repetitive sounds. And he finds 87 sounds in the language that he gives symbols to. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, these, you'll see, those are his symbols. They come out of his own mind by his own hand. They don't exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, you'll see a few symbols that do pop up. If you look the second symbol down, uh, looks like a clef symbol. If you look uh, a couple other places, there's, uh, I think, an H, a six. But typically, they're, they're flowing. Um, according to Cherokee tradition, uh, they say it, that he drew inspiration from uh, patterns on butterflies and on insects and birds. Um, as, a, as a silversmith, if you look at a lot of those, those designs, it's that same flowing uh, lines that you would see maybe uh, in a, a patch box on a musket uh, on, carved into a gorget that uh, he might have learned to make or made. Um, so I think these influences come from from both both nature and from um, uh, his experience in being a silversmith. Um, this is uh, this is what's done in 1821. By 1826, the printing press comes along, uh, a Union Acorn Press, um, and we have a problem. These symbols don't exist, so they would have to create molds. They would have to create different size molds. They would have to cast all the different type and have to cast thousands of type to be able to print a newspaper, a book. And so what happens, uh, there's a gentleman that comes along is Elias Boutenot, Reverend uh, well, Elias Boutenot, excuse me. Um, if we go to the next slide. And what happens, we know Elias Boutenot, probably Reverend Samuel Wooster and a couple of other Cherokees uh, are involved in taking Sequoia's very flowing symbols and then they change them to symbols that we see, uh, that we recognize. Those symbols existed, so it made it cheaper to buy the printing press. Um, as you see, D's, R's, T's, I's, um, those made it cheaper to buy the press. You see some where like an O uh, that's got a squiggly tail. Um, I think there's an I with a tail. Um, they're upside down four. Uh, different versions of C's and G's. Well, it looks, 
it makes it look a little bit different. It costs a little more, but not what it would be if they were trying to create Sequoia's really original syllabary. And then you'll see a few symbols, and this is my personal thought, is you see a few symbols that exist nowhere else in the world, and that makes it unique. And so somewhere between Sequoia symbols and this one, um, they drop one. So there's 86 uh, syllables in this syllabary. Um, and I think um, uh, Dr. Gill could talk more about the, the symbols. I know there was, they dropped to 20, uh, 85 and then went back to 86. Um, but this, uh, this enabled the Cherokee to probably, uh, you know, as I tell our tour groups, in 5,000 years of human civilization, in the records all around the world, no one person has ever created a writing system that was illiterate. Um, from what we, I mean, Sequoia never went to one of the, the schools. He never learned to read or write in English, German, Latin, French. Uh, and over that 12 year period, being illiterate, he created the Cherokee syllabary. Um, I, from, you know, the creation of the syllabary, uh, the, the Cherokee Nation buys the uh, Union Press, and um, we actually uh, bought, uh, found, tracked a, we couldn't find a Union Acorn Press, but we found an Otis Tufts 1833 Acorn Press. It's the closest thing, it's seven years newer, but it's the exact same technology. Uh, that, that was used at New Echota. And so uh, by next year, uh, we'll be printing uh, the Cherokee syllabary and printing um, uh, here at the museum with that. And I guess the press enabled, once they bought the press, uh, they created the Cherokee Phoenix. Elias Boutenot uh, was the editor, first editor there. And, you know, the Cherokee Phoenix, it helped the Cherokee communicate as a nation, uh, as a people. Um, at the first editions of the Cherokee Phoenix were the uh, newly written Cherokee Constitution, and it was printed in Cherokee and printed in English. Uh, it was the first, in my understanding, is the first bilingual newspaper in the United States printed in Cherokee and English. Um, and so, uh, you know, as this, as Sequoia struggles, there's a lot of stories. Um, there's things that we know that are carved in stone with Sequoia, that he was at a certain place or something exactly happened. Then there's, we go into a, an area where there's, there's, we're pretty sure something happened, but to what degree uh, that it happened. And then there's areas that is very gray, that it sounds like it could have happened, it's, mm, but there's no primary source. There's no, uh, there's no, Proof, and then then we go to just out and out lies. Um, there was a book written back in the seventies uh, that reads very is very believable, but it's it's the person that wrote it is the only person in the world that has the primary sources, um, and it's kind of amazing that that's the only person in the world that found those primary sources, and there's no other evidence. Um, so, like I say, there's there's the lies, and as a storyteller. Uh, we all kind of know that you don't let the truth get in the way of a good story sometimes. So is that, I, I, I can't read with it. That's great. Thanks, Charlie. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're going to move on to Lou and Gill. Um, so if you can you know, pick us up and uh, tell us a little bit about your life. Um, very vague, but uh, tell us about your life growing up as Cherokee in um, the Eastern Band, in Snowbird. Um, I'm sure many guests um, here uh, are aware of the, um, of, uh, I'm sorry, of Gil and Lou, um, but you know, Snowbird community is a small community of Cherokee in uh, Western North Carolina. Um, and so we'd love to hear from um, you two on that experience. Uh, 
Um, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? My experience at uh, Snowbird Day School, when I started at uh, age six, I didn't speak any English, had no clue, but we had some excellent teachers and getting to play with the bus driver's daughter who spoke nothing but English, sort of helped me a little bit here and there. And, uh, but it, was, it took a long time to, to learn the English language but our like i said but our teacher were so good that it really helped that they did the repetition stuff and she did a lot of visual uh, uh material that uh, that helped us because we could look at stuff so and that's pretty much what i use today is the visual aids so i think it helps the adults as well as the kids that i'm working with and it was a wonderful experience to go to school at Snowbird because everybody spoke Cherokee. We played together, we ate together, and we were in the class. I think there were eight of us in my grade when we started uh, at Snowbird. And it was just, it was great. We went home and spoke our language. Come back next day, we spoke our language. And our teacher, you know, was very good. She didn't discourage us. We kept talking our language, and she would just teach us every day, did just the repetition stuff. Gil, do you have anything to add? You're muted um, if you're if you're speaking. Okay, uh, so one of the aspects of um, Indian day schools, it's a little different than the, the boarding schools that if you know anything about this history, um, and um, Charlie kind of spoke to it briefly um, about assimilation and Americanization of uh, Native Americans, in that uh, this was seen as the proper way of existing if if you wanted to be an american you held fast to the the european um ways of life and religion and indian boarding schools started up in the mid 1800s and these schools um were some of them were started in uh, in reservations others um would extend to actual boarding schools where uh, Indian kids would be taken to uh, these boarding schools. And they were taught basic aspects of um, lessons. Um, they learned English, very rudimentary lessons, uh, but they also were assimilated. So they were taught Christianity. They um, the young boys had their hair cut off so that it looked more um, traditionally European. Um, they also forbid them from speaking um, their native language um, and gave them American or European names. And so for a while, that's what you, uh, that's what kids, uh, what they experienced at these schools. and. Of course, that's not always the case, um, but that's overwhelmingly the narrative that we see. Um, a lot of that would come to change in the 1930s um, as mindsets were changing and people were coming in and creating um, a more understanding and, and allowing uh, the Native Americans to find agency within themselves. Um, and so as these changes arise, you see um, these different schools being a little bit more lenient to the kids. And when um, Gil and Lou 
would have been going to the Snowbird Day School. That was later, and I was watching um, some, doing some research on that, learning that um, Snowbird was also unique in that they were pretty secluded, and they have always been uh, pretty secluded um, from even Cherokee, uh, North Carolina. So that created a very unique situation. Um, and so my question to Gil and Lou, um, how was your experience? How did you recognize that it was different uh, for you? Um, I know Lou talked about it, that you had a very positive experience going there. Um, but knowing what you know now, are you, um, are you surprised or um, how does that impact this knowledge impact you? Well, we got such a positive uh, return from our teachers. They believed in us and they encouraged us and they got us ready to go to the public school. And all the things that they taught us just prepared us and they brought the, the sixth graders out and we'd have like a, a May Day in a, right before school was out so that we could meet some of the students before we went to the um, public school. And it was the kids that were going, we were going to be in the same grade with in the seventh grade. So they, we got to meet, make new friends and we got to play some sports. And, you know, so we knew a few faces when we went out there. So it wasn't total, a total, um, um, I guess, being nervous and worrying and those kind of things. I, I did tell my teacher that. I said, I'm going to miss the good food that we have here. And he said, well, you'll get used to it and you're going to be OK. So, you know, he, he was so encouraging that. I think that really made a big difference at, in preparing us for the state school. Gil, can you unmute now? Hey, Gil, why don't you try logging out and then logging back in to the event? I saw your message about losing audio. That's probably going to be the best bet because we really need you in this. You're a vital part. <laughs> OK, so as we wait for him, um, I'll continue with Lou. Thanks for your response um, and do you think language is important to understanding and connecting with your ancestral past to your ancestral culture oh yes uh, and i miss a lot of the things that uh, um that we did growing up and uh, the community things that we participated in um the church you know in church we would have the bible reading all in um the preaching would be in Cherokee. The Sunday school classes would be in Cherokee. Yeah, I miss all that. We don't have that anymore. A few churches have that. And um, but at one time, everybody spoke Cherokee in the church. So uh, you said we don't you know, nobody's doing that very much anymore. And even when you speak to somebody, we speak English to each other. And, you know, so since a year ago, I've decided that every time I see a speaker, I will speak Cherokee, you know, and and these kids that I see on uh, in my class, when I see them on the street, I say I speak Cherokee to them. And I have a talk in my church that I sp spoke to uh, Sunday. We had a dinner and I said, what are these foods we eat? You know, those kind of things. And the grandparents played a big part, too, in, in uh, our culture. You know, they brought in taught us a lot of stuff. My grandpa used to say, sit down, I need to tell you something. And just sit for and listen to me. You know, we don't do that anymore. You know, everybody is in such a big hurry and we, we forget to ways of gardening. We forget those things. And it's important we we bring those things back as well as not just the language, but you can do
Okay, yeah. Lou, we lost you there for a second. Um, but yes, I agree. Thank you for the feedback. Um, Gil, did we get you back? Okay, not sure. Um, I know that their uh, signal's not the best, so uh, that's probably what's happening there. That's a great question, um, Linnell, and so we can ask that later. Um, but can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't. Okay. Did you want to take a stab at any of the questions? Yep. Hello. I can. Can you hear me? Yes. We're talking. Which question are we talking about? Linnell's question, or is there another question? Because I've lost my audio for a few minutes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes, we we're just going over the question about. Do you think that language is important to understanding your? and connecting with your cultural past. Okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I definitely think it's uh, critically important. Um, in English, we really cannot truly translate Cherokee into English and English into Cherokee. And there's so many things that um, we just we're just not able to understand the language, and you really won't completely understand some of the um, ceremonies. You completely you won't be able to understand um, uh, nature and even plants and animals. Um, I, you know, it's it's just really um, I think critical that. Um, you be a first language speaker to um, to understand who you are and um, to understand the land and um, all of creation, in fact. And did you want to speak to your experience in the Snowbird Day School since we didn't get to hear from you on that? OK, let me uh, let me just go back to the first question, the importance of learning Cherokee as a child. Um, yeah, because I missed all of them. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. at, at present, we only have about 193 fluent speakers. And the way we define fluent speakers are people who grew up speaking Cherokee as a first language, like me and like my sister Lou. Um, because we did not begin to learn English until we started uh, the Snowbird Day School. And that was generally around five years old, six years old, in some cases, seven years old. And um, by that time, we were fluent in the language, in, in our language, and we were beginning to learn Cherokee uh, English. Um, what we found, what I found when I was um, administrator in the Cherokee uh, Immersion School was that if we took a child as an infant and started talking to him in an immersive situation, um, it wasn't long before when they would take a nap, they would be talking in their sleep in language. Um, and all the verbs, the nouns, and there, were, there was no accent. Now, if you start teaching somebody who's 15 or 20 years old or even 30 years old, there's a marked difference in the way a child who has learned to speak from an infant stage to a person who starts learning at 25 years old in terms of um, fluency, in terms of accent, and in terms of understanding um, um, the Cherokee words, which cannot be translated into English. 
uh, we can do our best and explain to them what it means, but we can never truly come across with the complete definition of some of our words back into English. Um, so I think it's critical, again, learning Cherokee as an infant or as a child. Um, can, can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, growing up in the Snowbird Day School, like I said, I could speak English. And um, I remember starting school, and we had no idea. I'm not, Lou may have spoke on it, but I didn't get to hear what she had to say. Um, probably about 90% or maybe 95% of the children uh, who attended school at the Snowbird Day School. We were not able to speak English um, for several weeks. And at the time, we probably, according to the teachers, we probably spoke flipped. Some people would say we probably spoke backwards. Our nouns and our verbs are um, flipped from English. And as, as an example, if I want to say water, um, I would say water is what I want. Um, and I'll give you an example. Water is a, uh, ama, and just listen to it. The water's going to come first. Ama, I will do it, huh? So, so our verbs and um, so we were probably, according to the teacher, we were probably speaking backwards. Um, but I don't like to say backwards because it's just flipped. Um, saying that it was backwards is kind of um, denigrating the language. So I use it when I teach, I use it to tell the student it's flipped. You got to flip your nouns and your verbs. Uh, there's so many things about our language that um, is so different. And, and, but anyway, going back to the Snowbird Day School, it was a while before we um, began to pick up. I'm not, I don't remember, it's been, I'm, I'm not picking up English, but I remember sitting in the classroom, um, maybe the first day, could have been the second day, could have been the third day, and I needed to use the bathroom. And I had no idea how to say I need to be excused or I need to go pee. And I remember asking one of the older boys, Probably my brother, and um, I asked him, huh, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? And he mumbled something like, I need to be excused. So I mumbled something back to the teacher, and she just kind of pointed to towards the restroom. And I, and I assumed from that that she was giving me permission to go use the bathroom. And um, But that was pretty much um, the, the case for most of us who attended the snow school. And I remember another time, and probably early on, maybe first grade, probably first grade, maybe even the second week, third week. And um, we could not tell. So the teacher says, it's noontime. I, I vividly remember that. It's noontime. And um, and it was time to eat. And being a Cherokee speaker, I understood the word noon for potato in our language. And so I kind of put two and two together and, you know, deduced that um, it must be time to go eat some potatoes and uh, <laughs> made me really happy. So um, so in terms of um, how was the school different from, you know, Indian days and you know, the normalist in day schools that existed throughout the country or even the boarding schools that existed through the country. I think Lou was speaking on uh, our teachers. They did not discourage us from speaking the language, but they did encourage us to learn English. Um, they were very encouraging. And yet, that's I think that was probably the biggest difference from our day school to other day schools um, where they were, where the teachers were instructed and followed the Bureau of Indian Affairs policy of assimilation. They didn't um, discourage us from uh, speaking Cherokee. They did not whip us. and um, the stories are rampant about uh, other day schools and other boarding schools where children were whipped or their mouths were washed out with soap, um, uh, speaking the language. Uh, but in our day school, that was not the case. Um, I recently did a survey and interviewed uh, most of the speakers who were alumni of the Snowbird Day School, and I, want to, I remember one student or one alumni who mentioned getting whipped. 
um, at the Snowbird Day School. And the way she told the story, um, she and another classmate, they were speaking English. But on that particular day, they had a substitute teacher. I guess they'd sent somebody from um, the main school in Cherokee, North Carolina, um, because our regular teachers were out. <clears throat> and because the substitute was um, adhering and following the BIA policy of assimilation and you know, punishment if they, if they were caught speaking, um, she had her... Um, it almost pissed it off because they were speaking a language. Both girls um, were whipped and um, their ears were pierced with the, the teacher's fingernails. And that is the only time that I remember anybody getting uh, any kind of a punishment for speaking the language. So that's um, my experience in school. The thing that we treasured probably as much as anything else was the food. Uh, most of the families in our community were extremely poor, and um, a lot of us did not wear shoes at school. Uh, I know our, my brothers and my siblings and sisters, we walked to school, and that was that was a really fun time to be. Uh, walking to school, we would throw rocks at squirrels, we'd go through the woods, and um, sometimes we'd be on time, but most of the time we would be tardy. And um, they never said not, not much to us, except they tried to encourage us to be on time and to be in attendance. Um, so I think from the interviews that I did with the Snowbird Day School alumni, that was probably the central theme was how good the food was. And, and I'm sure it was good, but part of it was because we were hungry. Uh, so that's um, part of my um presentation for your questions. Thank you, Gil. That was great. Um, I don't know if Lou ever made it back. I don't see her on the thing in the chat. Um, but for the audience, um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A after um, if you wanted to give us any feedback or whatnot. Um, in regards to everything that we've talked about, um, how do you think um, Snowbird being where it was and when it was, um, Gil and Lou would have been going to school in the 60s. Um, and at, by this point, a lot of things um, are changing, especially in the 60s. Um, but the school itself started in the 30s, I believe. Um, do does anyone have any any thoughts in regards to these uh, assimilation practices and how it would come to impact um, the the Cherokee or other Native Americans in in Tennessee? We have uh, several other. Um, nations um, like the Chickasaw and the Choctaw out in West Tennessee. Uh, so they're by means not the only um, Native groups that once lived here. I know a lot of people are coming from North Carolina too, uh, but oh, hi Lou. Um, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. That's a good question. Um, I will, again, we'll do Q&A towards the end. Um, but if you had any thoughts on that, um, any thoughts on how um, assimilation would have impacted um, Native groups beyond, you know, what we already know, um, feel free to um, add that to the chat. And again, I'm going to turn it over to Lou and Gil now that they're back. And if you can go over the uh, the framework of Cherokee and how that worked. I know Gil said he was um, fine speaking to that. Um, and then also 
if we could hear some Cherokee so we can hear what that sounds like. That's not really something a lot of people get to hear. Thank you. And Gil, did you want to go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Time, but that's a pretty good sampling of um of our language. And she was asking, Lee was asking, um, do I think that we can turn the loss of language around back into um, where the community can start um, speaking again? And my response was, I think we can, but we have to start with the infants. And Lee was responding, yeah, even pregnant, even during pregnancy. Uh, the child is able to hear, and that's really what um, I think our moms and dads used to do: is that they would they would speak in in front of us while we were still in the womb, and that's when we started learning our language, and that's how we became fluent speakers, was um, when we're still in the womb. So that was my response to Lou's question. And can you give us? Um a little breakdown of the way Cherokee works, like the sentence structures and why that's difficult for a lot of people to learn with later in life. Can I answer that? Start off and go ahead. Um, I was talking to uh, another speaker the other day and uh, we were talking about people saying, you know, you need to flip those your, your verbs and, and all. And she said, did we flip verbs when we were growing up? And I said, no. And she said, well, we don't need to flip them today. She said, we need to speak it. And she said, and if you're a speaker, she said, you're going to understand what the speaker, other speaker is saying. She said, just worry about speaking it. Don't worry about where you put your words or how you, how you put your words in a sentence. She said, that's, that's okay. She said, when they get up in college and yeah, but for now, she said, we need to just speak it because we can understand it. So I, I agreed with her. Things that um, makes Cherokee different is that when we speak, 
um, are verbs are plurals. In English, nouns are plurals. And the way I teach, uh, I try to teach it as simple as I can in terms of um, the language so that um, the people I teach can grasp what and able to converse at some basic level. And so when I teach it, I teach uh, making a question, the first word in a sentence. And, and I teach it using the two or three different ways you can make a question. And, but I don't teach all three ways. I only teach one way, which is um, I can say, uh, do you want water? And if, I'll remind you, water, the word for water is ama. And if ama, A-M-A. Okay, if I say, do you want water? I'm going to say, and I put the question on the very first word. It's a real simple rule that um, is easily understood by small children, younger people, high school kids, or college students. And I'll say, do you want water? Amash. And if you hear the S at the end of ama, amash, zaduli ha. The question is that the first word under on the word water. And if you remember now, water is a noun. So generally, um, the questions become, or is usually the first word, but that is the way I teach it. But there's other ways of teaching a question also. Put it at the end of the sentence, but, and there's a couple of different ways of making it. Now, as I said, <clears throat> verbs become plurals, stay singular. Like if I say, um, do you want apples? The word for apples or apple is shakta, and it is a noun. So when you say, do you want apples, the verb is what has to be turned into plural. Uh, and, and again, I'll give you an example. The word for apple is shakta, shakta. And I'll say it one more time, shakta. Now I'm going to put the question on the apple, but I'm going to the verb, plural, shaltas deja dulia. I'm going to say two different ways. Do you want an apple? Shaltas jadulia. That's singular. Do you want an apple? Now, if you'll listen very carefully, I'm going to put the question, and I'm going to make the verb plural. Shaltas. That's the question. Deja dulia. I put the, and when I put the plural. When I the verb plural, it's at the beginning of the word. It's a very complex language. And um, it just really throws some of the students off sometimes at the high school level because they, they have a really hard time. In addition, we have many verbs, what we call object category verbs. When you're talking about some of the um, verbs, you have to talk in terms of, um, if I say, do you want an apple, which, do you want an apple, which is a solid? If I'm talking about a piece of paper, it's flexible. I have to say, do you want a piece of paper that is flexible? If I'm talking about something rigid, or long and rigid, long and or rigid, I have to say, do you want a pen which is long and rigid? And if I'm talking about water, which is a liquid, I have to say, do you want water which is a liquid? Okay? If I'm talking about a cat, I have to say, do you want a cat which is an animal or alive? So that's it's a very complex question. And um, teach a very small amount of uh, basic conversation, uh, but until we start working with infants and even pregnant moms, uh, it, it's a very tough um, process of teaching and retaining the language that we've lost so much. Like I said, we, I'm not really sure if it's 193 fluent speakers or 194 at present. It's 196. People like Lou and me that we learned Cherokee as a first language and did not learn
Yeah, uh, it's 193 speakers, fluent speakers right now. Okay. And and I think it was, uh, we had 256 in 2000. I talked a little bit about the complexity of the language. There's other things that make it even more complicated too. But um, um, Gail, you hear me? I think there's some delay on his end. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, I was just saying there were 256 fluent speakers in 2012, so we've lost quite a few speakers since then. Um, actually, Lou, can you talk about, um, I'm, I'm sure both of you can speak on um, the efforts right now to teach younger kids and as well as um, just teach those interested in uh, learning Cherokee. Um, what that looks like um, across the Cherokee Nation. I think here in our community, there's a, a big interest. I've had some parents tell me that they're ready to come into class too, but of course, because of this COVID, we've been kind of, you know, held up. So, um, but I think there's a big interest. And they said we could be helping the kids at home speaking the language if we could speak it. So, and, you know, and I agree with them. And the younger the kids, the better it is. Uh, I've got some kids that comes in to my class and they can't read yet. You know, maybe they're in kindergarten, but I can do pictures and, and show it to them. And I can say, can you make me a three word sentence? And I'll give them the words and they'll say, well, tell me the words. And I and then they can pick it up and say the sentence. And then I do a lot of rewards too. So. You know, just a little piece of bubble gum or something when they do something great or if they can get 25 animals or all the colors, you know, just just a little something. And I've had some really good donations from other people that uh, are that are interested and uh, wants to help. So I get little donations from, you know, so then I can do a little rewards and that really makes a big difference. We play a lot of bingo so we can have some prizes. And so you you would say that there's a high interest in in trying to keep the language alive. I think so, especially here in Snowbird. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. I, I know that that's the same in many um, indigenous groups um, making efforts. And I know that um, there are different schools, uh, colleges in particular, offering courses in um, Cherokee or different languages. So there are efforts being made in preserving. Um, I know that Smithsonian Institution also has uh, is working on preservation efforts or helping different uh, indigenous groups preserve their languages. So um, I know that there was a study done in the 90s that helped spur this this push. Um, when people notice that a lot of these languages are slowly declining with their native speakers. Um, so the it's just starting. 90s weren't that long ago. Um, but we can hope that as you can, there's there's many people here on the line who are interested um, in the language and hopefully if if we can keep the interest in um, the various um, indigenous groups going that the preservation of these languages can and can keep on. Um, did you did anyone have any comments? Before we move on to questions. Uh, Joyce. Yes. Um, just a, a, one of the things, uh, Lou and Gil's sister, Shirley Oswald, um, when I first came to the museum, uh, she was one of the first uh, uh, people I met. Uh, she was uh, uh, one of the few Cherokee vendors that was here at our fall festival that we were doing. Um, 
And I don't know, it was in within one or two years. Uh, I can't remember if I approached her or if she approached me, but uh, we, we put together a, a Cherokee language class. And the first class we held, it was in the old exhibit. And if you go back to the old exhibit, there was a, a diorama of Sequoia and Aoka. Um, and it was a kind of a diorama of Sequoia teaching Aoka how to read and write the syllabary. And um, uh, I'll never forget that night, the first night that we did the class, we'd set up the table and Shirley came in and set up. And I, if I remember right, we had seven people that signed up for that class. Um, and uh, for me as a museum professional, that was probably one of the, is one of my highlights of my career was standing there seeing Shirley speaking Cherokee in front of the diorama of Sequoia and Aoka. And um, it, it was an incredible moment. And uh, so, um, you know, it, it, Shirley was a great lady and a great sister. I love that. Yeah, it's always, as an, a fellow museum person, it's always uh, really impactful to have those moments where history is reflected in the modern day. So that's what that sounded like. And, and seeing that translated, it, it does sound very nice. Um, there was a comment here saying that the Eastern Band has no program um, that is producing fluent speakers. Um, I'm not too sure about that. Um, do you, Lou, Gil, any any thoughts on that? I'm not sure uh, what all they're doing, you know, uh, on the boundary, but I know there's some classes and then uh, um, they've got some, several different programs, I know. I just don't know exactly how to do them. The Gadua. Charlie? Uh, the Gadua Academy? Hmm. Um, doesn't it, it starts at kindergarten and goes to the sixth or seventh grade? I've, I've been know if Lou or Gil might know more about it. I've, I've been over there to the, the, the to the school, um, but I'm not that familiar with exactly. But, but they teach in a Cherokee, it's the Cherokee language. Mm -hmm. It does sound like there are various schools in the area um, working towards uh, teaching Cherokee. Um, but let's move on to questions. Um, there have been a few coming in. Um, one of the first ones was there, is there an effort to offer Cherokee as a second, second language? And that's probably, I guess, in high school. Um, I, do you know? Neil's teaching at the high school. Okay. It's, I think they have the uh, elementary and middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. I know you could take it at Western Carolina University as a second language. Yeah, and I did mention earlier there have, there are other schools that offer, um, at least college level, uh, that offer Cherokee as a second language. So there are there are places. Yeah. Apparently Chapel Hill does as well. Um, another question is the Snowbird Day School, was it missionary based? I don't think so. I think Gills is coming in a little choppy, but from what I read when it was first created, it was uh, started as a Quaker school. Um, I don't know if I, that was wrong, but that's what I read. 
respond to the three questions. Yes. That is correct. Okay. Roger Young, uh, Tennessee is based on a Cherokee word. You're right. Mm -hmm. then if you can, if I can uh, say, I talked about um, no influence produced. I think that is a correct statement. You're on the guard. That was me. See you, Lou. See you. Thank you for uh, your comment. Um, and then we also, if again, if you have more questions, feel free to send them in. Um, there was another uh, two questions. Did family structure change um, after? Um, through influence of assimilation, um, did and also did gender roles change? Family structure changed very dramatically uh, during the simulation because most, many, many children were placed in boarding schools. And and in some cases, they were able to return home. And a lot of they, that was where they lived until they finished school. And when you don't have parents and role models, you don't know how to become a good parent. And um, yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. And um, yeah, because I mean, if a child was taken from the community at five years old or six years old or whatever age they might have been, um, and didn't return back into the family in 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, they lost a lot of um, parenting skills. So, yes, I think that um, that also has contributed to some of the social issues that we have at present, um, child neglect, child abuse, um, because I mean, that's what children in BI or uh, boarding schools learned was that, you know, they were severely punished just for uh, speaking the language. And, uh, you know, when you teach it, you know, that's what they learned. That was the norm. And um, so when you become parents, and if that is what you have learned as a norm, then that is how you raise your children. So yes, the family structure changed, and um, we're still with some of the issues from the simulation policy back in the fifties and sixties. Um, and as for the question about uh, if the gender roles change, actually, if you did not make it to our first uh, program. Uh, it was on women, um, Native women in the role in politics. And that was uh, done by Amanda Lee Savage of the um, University of Memphis. She kind of speaks to that, to that role in the, in the gender roles in the reversal or the, uh, the changes that came about. So if you're interested in that topic, uh, go back. It's recorded and recorded, and it's on our YouTube page. Uh, so if you just search Tennessee State Museum, uh, that should be available to you. Um, but the question is, or the answer is, yes, it they do change. Um, there was a question here. This is: Has anyone paid any attention to the Sequoia Original Syllabary Order? Um, not quite sure what's meant by that, but um, uh, 
if you have any thoughts, Gil, Charlie. Um, I don't, I don't teach the syllabary because it doesn't really promote um, speaking, and that's my primary concern is that teaching young people or any student to speak. And because of that, I, I don't even, um, I do teach at school only because it meets some of the core standards. Um, if I wasn't required by the State uh, Department of Education, I would never even touch the syllabary because I, I'm a firm believer that the syllabary does not promote speaking. So I do teach um, ethics. I do teach um, the use of the language and uh, for that reason, that's why I don't choose to um, choose to uh, teach the syllabary. So I've seen the original syllabary, and but I've not paid any effort to learn it or um, to teach it. And there's a comment in um, from Caleb. I'm not sure who Caleb is, but anyway. Um, it's talking about, um, yeah, the, the problem becomes in teaching the language that the, even at college or high school, um, even one Cherokee a day or maybe even an hour and a half or even two hours a day does not produce a speaker. Um, it has to be in an emergency situation where they, uh, speakers speak the language. Um, and experience and work in the immersion program for almost 10 years um, through the immersion program um, children were able to communicate and between each other um, fluently at a very basic level uh, but had they had the program continued to be an immersion program they it, you know it would definitely um, produce speakers but that does not exist at, at this point. And we have a, the Shirley started a six weeks uh, summer camp for the language, and we're continuing with that. And then after they finish the six weeks, they get a couple of weeks off. Then school starts, and then we go right into the after school program. So they uh, then we work with them four hours a day. Uh, now. Well, there's actually a really lively conversation going in the chat, which I appreciate. Uh, but I'm actually, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we're getting close to time. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today. This, this has been great. Um, to the, the person asking, will there be more like this? Um, this subject matter, um, I don't, I don't know, maybe we can work something out. Maybe uh, the Sequoia Birthplace Museum can um, have more conversations like this. Um, but, um, you know, we'll see. And uh, I did add some links in the chat. Uh, one is to the UNESCO, um, UNESCO Atlas of World Languages in Danger. And that way, that way you can find out more about languages even beyond Cherokee that are being worked on and, and where their status is of um, native speakers, um, as well as a language on preservation, or I'm sorry, an article on preservation um, that really helped me out um, understanding this topic and, and the efforts being done to preserve native languages. Um, but yes, again, uh, Thank you for everyone who um, stuck uh, stuck with us. I know that the technical issues made it a little sticky, uh, but yeah, this is our last um, program for Native American History Month. Uh, thank you for everyone who turned out. And um, I did wanna ask uh, Lou and Gil, if there's any people who are interested in learning Cherokee, are there any places you would direct them to to learn more about that? I guess just attend one of those classes and I would attend any class I could find if I would want to learn because it's that repetition that's going to get you there. I, 
I kind of lost my train of thought um, when I mentioned that Shirley, we started with seven students 18 years ago here at the museum. And uh, after Shirley passed, uh, Lou helped us out for a year, I guess, a couple of, of classes. And then, uh, excuse me, Gills helped us out for a while. And then Lou has taken over. Um, and before this epidemic, <laughs> pandemic started, uh, we I think we had two classes left. Um, we had 29 students. Um, and with Lou's help, uh, we actually have three classes when we generally when we do it here at Sequoia Birthplace Museum, uh, we do uh, we have a beginner class, an intermediate class and a, uh, an advanced class. And so uh, we typically try to do them uh, on a Monday night and we try to run them for four nights uh, in a row or four Monday nights in a row. Um, so once we get back to where we can actually have meetings, uh, with more than, you know, 10 people, 15 people, um, we will certainly get back to having uh, Cherokee classes here at Sequoia Museum. So uh, watch our Facebook page, our website. We'll, we notice, put it on the notices on those. So I want to thank Lou and, and Gil for, for helping us here, um, you know, bring the language into the Sequoia Birthplace Museum. So thanks, guys. Yes, and thank you, Charlie, Gil, Lou. Thank you for joining us. Uh, your, your thoughts are well appreciated. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who joined us. And um, I'll sign off. Make sure if you're in East Tennessee to stop by the Sequoia Birthplace Museum as well. And if you're in Middle Tennessee to stop by the Tennessee State Museum, we're, we'll be happy to see you. Okay, well, everyone have a good evening. And um, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.